We were treating AML with 7 and 3 back in 1977. Today in 2019 we are doing the same. What is the best way forward to change cancer treatment radically by 2029? I think we have to delve deeply into the basic causes of leukemia, and not just leukemia, I think it's true of all of cancers. And um, I think with our increasing understanding of the genomics of the tumor, we need to be analyzing every tumor that comes in, whether it's a leukemia, a lymphoma, or a solid tumor. Every tumor must be analyzed for the, the gene sequences, the genomics, the proteomics, uh, what are the drivers for the cancer. I think we have to invest more deeply into the basic science of cancer biology to find ways to cure these types of cancers, leukemia, I treat a lot of sarcomas. Um, it's going to take a major investment uh, to, to really interrogate the cancer cell, uh, both the whole, all the cells together, but the single cell, because there's such heterogeneity within cancer that you can get one clone that has a different signature, different genomic signature. They act very differently than the rest of the clones that exist. So I think with the advancing technology that is going to allow single cell analysis, and that technology is now here. We still have it at Columbia, and we're making an effort to do this. I think understanding this heterogeneity on a single cell basis will give us deep insights into the cancer biology. And hopefully that information will allow us to come up with new ideas, new testable hypotheses for new drug development against the multiple genes that exist in a very complex environment. Cancers are pretty smart. You know, they developed a very smart technique of, of, of diversity. And I think this diversity is the challenge we now face and understanding how to attack every cell within the context of this will be a challenge. In addition, we have to understand more about the tumor microenvironment. I think this is another area where we have just begun to explore. We focus so much in cancer and the cancer cell. We focus that the cancer cell exists in a niche. And this niche is a rich niche of, of tremendous amount other, of other cells, whether it's monocytes or macrophages, stromal factors, growth factors that stimulate the tumor to grow. And we must begin to better understand how those factors impact upon leukemia, those other cells or solid tumor cells, and how the interaction exists and find ways to interrupt those processes. And finally, of course, we have immunological effects because the environment of the tumor microenvironment is rich with T cells and NK cells and macrophages, all which have immunological effects. So I think, you know, it's, it's an answer to question, why are we any further in leukemia? I don't think we've really attacked, addressed all those different processes, but I think as we get closer to the technology that exists, we can integrate all of them together and hopefully come with, a, with better models and better test hypotheses for how to treat cancer. And, and that's the challenge for the next five years. Thank you. Excellent answer. Second question. There's three and a half million papers in cancer, 135,000 alone in 2017. But there's a staggering disconnect between great scientific insights and our ability to convert these into improved treatments for patients. What are we doing wrong? Well, it's devastating. Of course, cancer, some cancers are diminishing, lung cancer, and I think it reflects the fact that uh, smoking, at least in the United States, is decreasing. It shows that if you can change behavior, you can actually change patterns of tumor incidence. Um, cervical cancer would be another one where we've made inroads in terms of the incidence of cervical cancer, at least in the Western world. I mean, there are certain parts of the world where there aren't isn't access to cervical cancer screening technology, which should be easily done. I mean, there's a famous study presented at ASCO two years ago, published in JCO, where they took white wine vinegar in women in, in impoverished areas of, of India and Asia and were able to detect HPV just by wine vinegar detection on the cervix. There's different color once you put the white wine vinegar in, and anybody could go into the community and do that. You don't have to be a physician. You could be just a, any health care provider. We have to start being innovative. We have to find, start doing things and reach out to the communities, not just the civilized, civilized, that's the wrong word, the industrialized world. We're all civilized. Take it back. <laughs> it's, it's, I take it back. The civilized, the industrialized world where we have technology which drives us. Does the technology really bring us that much forward? And I think it does to some degree, but not enough. And it doesn't really achieve what might be very simplistic in how we approach how to prevent cancers, not alone how to cure them. I think we can learn how to prevent them as well as cure them. The prevention itself will have the bigger impact overall. I mean, curing cancer would be unbelievable. I mean, listen, I'm in this field to cure cancer. This is my goal. I want to cure cancer. We all do. How do we become oncologists to cure cancer? And we're certainly making major efforts to do that with all the research we're doing, the clinical research, the laboratory programs. 
But I think the biggest impact ultimately will be in cancer prevention, because we can't provide all the technology to the to the parts of the world where there is no access. And how do we, what do we do with those, those situations? The best we can do for that is, of course, introduce, tech, introduce the technology, make it accessible, affordable. But I think the biggest impact can, can we prevent cancers, whether it's screening tech, more screening efforts, vaccinations. I think we're gonna learn more and more about uh, tumors and, and this whole field we call neoantigens that are on the tumor cell that may provide opportunities for vaccine development. It wouldn't be wonderful that we actually had a vaccine to treat specific cancers. We can treat them by preventing them. We can certainly address smoking and viral etiologies, hepatitis and, herp and, uh, and, and cervical related uh, viral infections. But at the end, you know, that might not be enough in itself. And then we come up with vaccines and can we introduce vaccines like we have. Totally, it's, when you think about the history of, of medicine, what would have had the biggest impact on on curing diseases, been vaccine, polio, uh, tetanus, diphtheria. You know, I, mean, I know people don't want to get vaccinated now, but there. But when you think about the impact of such a thing that uh, that had a sabe and a sock and vaccinations have like prevented viral infections were devastating around the world. Can we bring that same technology to cancer? Can we find vaccines that will prevent cancer and make them easy and affordable for all patients? Because you can then massively vaccinate large populations of the world and prevent critical cancers from developing. And so we're making strides. So cervical cancer is one example, Hep B and hepatoma be another cancer. We're not close though in lung cancer and other diseases. So I think, uh, I don't know if I'm answering the question exactly yeah, the way you, you wanted know. to make, a, answer it, but I think, um, I think the, the, we, we're failing to deliver prevention, preventive te techniques that are very simple to the global community, that if we educated people sufficiently about the risk for cancer and try to change patterns of behavior, that in itself have a bigger impact than any chemotherapeutic agent that you or I could develop in, as, on a global level. Introduce there then vaccines on top of that and make those vaccines accessible to everybody at a cheap level. This is what we did for the, the history of medicine with viruses in the past, and I bring that to cancer. And ultimately, I think these 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 advances will have the biggest impact possible on, on cancer incidence and, and the curability of the disease, which which is really what we're aiming for. Brilliant answer, thank you, Gary. Uh, since you mentioned Western civilization, Mr. Gandhi was asked once, "What do you think of Western civilization?" And he said. It would be a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> the third question I'm very anxious to ask you because you are a world acknowledged, recognized leader in sarcomas, which is a disease that often affects children and adults, of course. The fact that children respond to the same treatment better mm. than adults seems to suggest that the cancer biology is different. But then, of course, the host is also different. Right. Now, since cancer is a disease of old age, right. then the problem comes up that having good therapy may not be the answer because the host is decrepit. Right. Your solution? Don't get old. <laughs> <laughs> Make us young again. Can I take back the years I lost? <laughs> you know? Can I be 29 again again? I mean, that might, <laughs> that's the solution. Uh, I mean, that, that would be one solution to de-age. Um, reality is uh, there are true differences between children and adults and how we respond to chemotherapy. As we see that in osteosarcoma. It's a different, these different diseases, and I think they're biologically different. So, for example, osteosarcoma in a child it, it's, is due to, uh, to a, a rapid uh, cellular turnover in the metaphyseal plate, which is the growth plate of a child. In adults, that growth plate is already sealed up, there's no metaphyseal plate, yet they get osteosarcomas. So the question is why? Well, it's because I think they're t they look the same under the microscope, and that's, that's that they're biologically different diseases. I think, you know, pathologically, these diseases look the same. If you had a kid and, a, and an adult with osteosarcoma, you put them in the microscope, you couldn't tell which was the kids, which was the adult, but yet they came from different cells, and I think that's part of it. There's a different stem cell biology between adults and children. I think the kids are, are much more resilient. Their, their, their stem cells, which are damaged by chemotherapy, bounce back much easier. Those younger stem cells versus the older stem cells. But the basic biology of the diseases are quite different. I think that's uh, one, one major factor between adults and children. There, there are different predisposing factors, and maybe genetic elements as well, that make the, the tumors more susceptible in children as opposed to adults. 
And as age, we listen. We, we, you know, there's a biology for this. So as we get older, we, we can repair the damaged DNA that we see from being exposed to the, the environmental factors that cause cancer, everything from the sun and getting melanomas to uh, environmental factors that are pollutants that maybe in the year we haven't even identified. And we, as, as our cells age, they lack the ability to fix the damage induced by these environmental factors. Children, as they're younger, we have those, those factors are, are not as, are, are, are healthier and can fix that damage that exists from these uh, cancer-causing uh, environmental approaches. And as adults, we, we lose those ability to fix the damage. And of course, as the damage takes place in a cell, the mutation will develop and those mutations will then multiply and cancers will come out. So it is biology. I think cancer is biology. And the cause of cancer in adults is biologically different than, than in children. Children don't have to worry about the fact that they, you know, they, they can repair, they have the, the, the apparatus is, is young, they can repair the damage. So there clearly are differences in the biology between adults and children. I think we, we lose track of that when we think about these differences, but it has an impact upon on tolerance of chemotherapy and outcomes as well. So it, whether it's a curable leukemia in child and, and less curable in adults, it's, it's, there's a biology behind that. Now, do we know all the biology? No. But we're, we're getting to understand those biologic differences do exist and they not only have an impact upon our, our cause of cancer, but even how we respond to the chemotherapies to cure cancer. Fourth question. You have great knowledge and experience in the field. If you are given limitless resources today, what is your solution to curing cancer? Well, I think it's what we talked about before. I invest heavily in cancer prevention. I still think the bang for the buck would be the best. We could prevent cancer from coming, whether it's investment in education, early detection methodology to catch it in its earliest form before it becomes advanced, before it becomes metastatic, and, um, and detect these new, whether it's circulating, it could be very simple just by clinical inspection, like I said, the white wine vinegar test, something, a penny, right? It doesn't need a doctor, just a penny for the community. Uh, or you get more sophisticated, circulating DNA, we don't know where that's gonna fit. That's probably too expensive for most of the world, but you know, costs will come down as we get better and better for a, and defining a blood test for cancer, of course, is the holy grail. Uh, historically, listen, my, you know, my father, in 1957, 58, developed the first technology to look at LDH isoenzymes as a biomarker in the blood to cause cancer. It was the first test ever done that anybody thought, well, can we develop a biomarker in the blood to cause, it might detect cancer. That's beautiful. So, and he found, he actually developed a biochemical assay to LDH isoenzymes. He's a biochemist. And he developed the first assay, he did it in blood, published it in cancer. The first paper published in cancer. The same cancer journal today. And, uh, and think about that. So it's 1957, here we're, what, how many years later? 50, 60, 70 years later, it's unbelievable. We're still having the same argument. How do, how do we detect cancer? So it may not be protein-based, it's Heathland, maybe it's DNA-based. And, and of course, we have to have tests that are both sensitive to pick up the tumor, uh, you know, how, that there are no false, false negatives and specific as well. So I think you know, there will be new technology to help us detect cancer earlier, and get, that gets back to the argument. If I had to make an investment, I'd invest in cancer prevention and cancer diagnost diagnostics to make early detection possible. After that, then I go into therapy. Okay, I still have more money left behind. Then we invest in therapeutics. And I think our understanding of the immune system is a critical new advance, and we have to learn more about that. We've made great advances, but I, th I still think we're in the very primitive area of, of understanding the immune system and this impact on cancer and cancer development. And of course, precision medicine, pathway development, and knowing, knowing what genes are involved in causing cancer and developing therapies around that. So that would be how I'd invest in, an, in a kind of uh, latter way approach. But I think, again, the investment in prevention and diagnostics and detection, ultimately that would have the biggest impact on upon cancer because you can get it early, you don't have to worry about therapy. It won't be a th there won't be need for treatment of advanced recurrent disease. There won't be need for metastatic therapies. They won't need them. And then, then you, but you'll still have the backup for immune therapy and targeted therapy because you'll still have investments for that as well. Perfect answer. <laughs> I can say now that I'm really proud to be working uh, with you as the chief of the division. It's mutual, Azra. I feel Wonderful. honored to be having you within our service, my the service. It's it's an honor for me. And I, I, I you know, when I came here, I, I didn't know you well, but I know you better, much better now. And I, I really, it's, I, I can't think of a more brilliant person. You you are fantastic, and Thank I'm just you. so glad you're part of our program. Thank you, Gary. Now the last question um, is a philosophical one. Okay. 
offering patients with advanced stage non-curable cancer palliative but toxic treatment. This is not a hard one. This is, this, this is the easiest one of the five, actually. Go ahead, finish it out. Is it a service or a disservice? Well, I think it depends, okay. I, I think toxicity without survival benefit is a disservice. And I'm a big advocate of making sure if you can have a, a drug that it's not just makes people respond, which is, you know, people want to see regression, right? They want, that's, there's a psychological impact of telling the patient, oh, the tumor got smaller. But if it comes at a cost of excessive toxicity, and the patient doesn't live longer, it's not worth anything. So for me, toxicity is okay. It's really we want to minimize toxicity because no one should suffer in, in oncology. But if a toxicity translates into a survival benefit, then I can then I think it's acceptable. Then the question always the next question would be, how much survival benefit? So if you're going to tell me you're going to the patient's going to suffer and have horrible toxicity, and they'll live four weeks longer. I say that's not, that's not valuable. And yet we see drugs approved currently, very expensive drugs for a four-week survival benefit because they meet a p-value. You know, the, the primary endpoint is a, a four-week survival advantage with a p-value greater than 0 .05, under less than 0 .05, and it gets, gets like 0 .04. Barely makes it, but it gets approved as a drug therapy. Though that's a disservice to the patient. Those were not helping anybody. So I think it, it's what you put the context of toxicity in. If toxicity results in a survival benefit to the patient, I think that's justifiable. But, and then the question gets to be how much of a survival benefit that should be. If it's a minimal survival benefit, again, it's not justifiable. But if it's months or years, clearly years, then I think that should be, would be acceptable. But no matter what we do, we should always minimize toxicity at the expense of whatever we, give, we do for the patient. We, we have an obligation to the patient, and the obligation to the patient is to do no harm and at the same time as oncologists find ways to make them to make them live longer and make them feel better. And I think that's what we're here to do. That's, at least that, that's why I say our mission. Thank you so much, Gary. These were very beautiful answers, and especially the last one has me tearing up because that is what all doctors should right, be doing, right. what you're suggesting. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. I thank you very much.